Hey everybody, welcome to another OCHEM video. Today what we're going to be going over is uh, the proteins and amino acids in regards to their chemistry and how they will be showing up on the MCAT. What are your important things to be familiar with about amino acids and proteins? Which things do you not need to memorize that people will often commonly memorize? Um, and yeah, so let's go ahead and get started by discussing amino acids, and then we'll work our way up to proteins. Get rid of all this gross physics. We're in OCHEM mode. All right, so we'll start with amino acid structure. So amino acid structure, we write amino acids most typically from N terminus to C terminus. And so we refer to either an amino acid or a peptide with the N and the C terminus. Both of which are going to have acidic or basic properties, basic properties for our N terminus and acidic properties for a C terminus. Amino acids will also have an R group and a hydrogen coming off of their chiral carbon, which is known as the alpha carbon. So we encountered alpha carbons back when we were going through additions, as well as, yeah, mostly additions and enolates. So our first point is that amino acids are chiral. Amino acids are chiral. And so we will have, if we draw Fischer projections for our amino acids. Remember in Fischer projections, we always start with the most oxidized carbon up at the top. And then on our alpha carbon, which is in the middle here, we'll either have the amino on the left or on the right. And this will determine whether the amino acid is D or L. So will this be a D or an L amino acid where our amino group is on the left side of the Fischer projection? And it'll be an L amino acid. And then over here, we will have a D amino acid. Which version is the naturally occurring form? Are amino acids naturally D or L? Uh, so, so sugars are naturally D. So you hear all the time about D glucose, D fructose. Uh, amino acids are going to be naturally L. So if you go to your local nutrition shop, you can buy all of your supplements and stuff. You'd be able to find amino acids such as L-alanine, L-tryptophan. Um, some, some bodybuilders will take amino acids to sort of like as a supplement. And so you'd be taking the L amino acid. So people often will ask, is there any correlation between DL and RS? And the answer is yes. So D is usually R and L is usually S. The two exceptions are cysteine, which follows DSLR. So cysteine switches it up, where D will be S and L will be R. Now the reason for this, it's a little bit out of the scope of this video, but if you wanna try it on your own, um, tr I would recommend trying to do stereochemistry for a generic amino acid, such as 
L alanine. And then compare that to what you get with L cysteine, particularly paying attention to your priority groups of one, two, three, and four, and if they change when it's cysteine. But for now, we're just going to talk about our rules. Anybody have any idea what might be another exception to this rule? Another amino acid that's an exception. Is there an achiral amino acid, one that is neither D nor L or R? Yes. yes. Glycine. Glycine, right? The other exception being glycine, which is achiral. We are going to be going over all 20 amino acids uh, as well in about three minutes. Okay. And that if you would like a mnemonic for this, the mnemonic for DR and LS. And, and this is this is terrible. I definitely did not come up with this. I uh, I don't recommend that you internalize this mentality because it's extremely toxic. And we're trying to get away from toxic gun or pre-med energy. But the mnemonic is you're either a doctor or a that can be how you remember that. Like I said, we're not we're not promoters of this toxic mindset. It just happens to be a fantastic mnemonic. Any questions on what we've covered so far? Okay, moving on, let's go over our 20 amino acids. I wish I had a bigger whiteboard, I won't be able to fit them all on. So, um, no matter what score you're shooting for on the MCAT, if your goal is to just break 500, if your goal is 510, if your goal is 528, what you must know, you must know all 20 amino acids, their side chains, their three letter abbreviations, and their one letter abbreviations. The way I recommend that you do this is if there's a few different ways you could efficiently do this. Um, you could get a whiteboard. You know, it doesn't have to be a big one like mine. It could be just a tabletop whiteboard. Um, and what I like to do is I like to write down the alphabet of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera, of all the one letter abbreviations. And then all of their three letter abbreviations, their class, um, any special notes about them. Go through all 20 amino acids or as many as you can fit and write down, for instance, A we know is for the amino acid alanine. We know the class is nonpolar. I'm gonna color code this actually. What do my colors do I need? I need red, blue, I need green and brown. So I like, I like nonpolar to be brown, it just feels like what nonpolar should be. And then once you've gotten all of your amino acids down or as many as you can fit, go through and just erase all of the one letter abbreviations, fill them back in. Erase all of the three letter abbreviations, fill them back in. If you're drawing your side chains, we're not gonna have time to draw all the, or space to draw all the side chains, but you need to draw them. You need to, you need to practice drawing the side chains or at least, being able to recognize them extremely well with high accuracy. Erase all the side chains, see if you can fill all the side chains back in, rinse and repeat. If you do this enough times, you'll know your amino acids. Another thing you can do, let's say you're a commuter, um, or let's say that you like to exercise a lot. So you can go through in your head and you can do a little song. Well, not really a song, but you can kind of do a song where it goes, A is for alanine, alanine's three letter abbreviation is ALA. Its class is nonpolar. B, there's no amino acid B. Okay, skip it. C, so just do the ABCs of amino acids using their one letter abbreviations and go through everything that you know about them. Okay, cysteine. Cysteine's three letter abbreviation is CYS. It's class. What's cysteine's class? Do we know?
So the options are polar, nonpolar, acidic, basic. Sustain, would it be polar, nonpolar, acidic, basic? Polar. It'll be polar. And then, okay, what is cysteine most famous for? Any special notes that we could make about cysteine? Disulfide bond. Disulfides. Yep, and then go through, and then rinse and repeat, and just go through the entire alphabet. You do that enough times, you'll also never be able to forget your amino acids. But it does require you to have studied them previously, because if you're like, if you're doing this on the on the fly, you're you're jogging, you're you're driving somewhere, you're not going to be able to to look up the structures very efficiently. So that's something that you would do maybe to to solidify your knowledge of amino acids after you've already done a fair amount of studying. Okay. And then the side chain for alanine, we know, is a methyl. And then let's proceed with the rest of our amino acids. So what amino acid is going to be D? Aspartic acid. Aspartic acid. So aspartic acid, ASP. And this guy is going to be what class? You know, it'll be acidic. And then E, who is amino acid E? It'll be aspartic acid's sibling, glutamic acid. Okay, I'm just gonna start doing P for polar, A for acidic. Yeah, that's better. Another acid. So our, what's nice is our two acids are next door neighbors, D and E. Glutamic acid is going to be ASP with an additional CH2. Um, how do I want to do this? With a with another CH2. Yeah. Then F. What is amino acid F? Phenylalanine. So they were, um, whoever designed this was cute. They knew that there weren't enough letters where every amino acid could have its own. And so they were like, okay, phenylalanine is F. And then what would be the class for phenylalanine? Polar, nonpolar, acidic, basic. Nonpolar, excellent. And then we could say that phenylalanine is alanine with a phenyl. Now, be careful, this is phenyl. Phenyl, not phenol. Phenyl is just benzene as a substituent. So if we take an alanine, which is just a methyl, and we add a phenyl group, we get phenylalanine, and that is where the name comes from. Uh, the other class for phenylalanine, of course, having that benzene ring means it's also aromatic. AR is going to stand for aromatic. All right. Um, any questions so far before I erase and we proceed through the rest of the alphabet? So then, of course, we have G is for whom? It's going to be our glycine, GLY. And then our class for glycine, glycine will be nonpolar. And what's special about glycine is because its side chain is just an H, it is achiral. H is for histidine. And what class of amino acid is histidine? basic. And just for anybody who might have that question in their head, when you say acidic, Charlie, you mean polar charged acidic. 
And yes, I do. So when we say acidic and basic, what we're also implying is polar and charged. So those are implicit when we say that something's acidic or basic. Um, histidine is also going to be aromatic. So basic, aromatic. And then one other thing that we want to keep in mind for histidine, oh, sorry, yeah, for histidine is that its charge, unlike the other two basic amino acids, charge at physiological pH is neutral. And the reason for this is that histidine has a pretty weak basic um, side chain compared to the other bases. And so it requires a more acidic pH, being a weaker base, to gain a positive charge. Um, and one pKa some people will memorize is pKa of histidine side chain, which is going to be 6.00. And so you can connect that. We're going to go through pKa, pH, charge, pI for, for amino acids as well today. And so one thing you can do is you can keep that in mind and practice on your own so you can prove yourself at what pHs would histidine be positive, would it be neutral? Uh, what do I mean by polar basic? Um, so when you're, when you're basic amino acid, such as, um, I don't want to draw histidine because I might get it wrong, <laughs> uh, such as lysine. So when you're basic at physiological pH, you're going to have a positive side chain. Um, and that would be true for, for lysine and arginine, not for histidine. And to be basic, you, you already have to be very polar. So, um, and by polar, we mean that you have a dipole or that uh, you have a net dipole that does not cancel out. Did I answer your question? Or do, you need, or do I need to further clarify? Okay, cool. And then HI, I is for whom? I is going to be isoleucine. Isoleucine. And leucine and isoleucine are going to be nonpolar amino acids. Um, the, the side chain, if you studied your alkyl groups, the side chain for isoleucine is going to be a seq butyl group. J, who's J? Trick question, no J. K, K is going to be for lysine. So I think in this case, there was already an L, which was leucine. And so they were like, well, we don't have a K amino acid. So lysine, the other, another one that starts with L is gonna be right next door to leucine who actually has L. Um, that's at least how it works in my brain. And lysine will be our other, our, one of our other two bases. And that's about it for lysine. Uh, and now L, which is going to be leucine. So just like isoleucine, we're going to have a nonpolar amino acid with L, leucine. And what I really don't like about whoever, like they did some really clever things, whoever designed this amino acid like alphabet thing. One thing I don't like is that leucine side chain is an isobutyl. Isoleucine side chain is a seq butyl. I really feel like they could have made isoleucine with the isobutyl just to make it nice, but uh, they did not have this in mind when they designed it, I guess. And then M. M is going to be for methionine. Methionine, unlike cysteine, which is our other sulfur containing amino acid, is going to be nonpolar. Um, that's because the sulfur to carbon in methionine side chain. At the very end, the sulfur to methyl is not as polar as the SH in cysteine uh, because we know hydrogen is less electronegative than carbon is. So we have a greater difference in electronegativity. So this guy, unlike cysteine, is going to be usually classified as nonpolar. Um, anything special about methionine? Where does methionine come up sometimes? What's special about methionine? 
thinking about protein synthesis, maybe. Where does the thionine always come in a protein? Yes, a star code R. Which has what three letter abbreviation? AG, very nice. Okay, any questions on G through M before we move on? Okay. And now, N, does anybody remember who N is for? Asparagine. Asparagine. So asparagine, who's going to be a polar amino acid, is very similar to which other amino acid? Asparagine is very similar to which other amino acid that we've already covered. It's like aspartic acid, isn't it? Asparagine is aspartic acid with an NH2 instead of a carboxylic acid. So that is where they got the name, at least in my mind. And also how you can remember that it's amino acid number N or letter N is asparagine is aspartic acid with an amine or technically it becomes an amide, an amide. Uh, but that's how I like to remember which one asparagine is because I used to get mixed up with freaking arginine all the time. Any questions on the sort of trick or like framework building that I just did there? What about O, do we have an O amino acid? No O, we skip right to P, L-M-N-O-P. And P is for proline. Proline is gonna be another nonpolar. And proline, anything special about proline? Or where do we often see it in proteins? I think at the beginning and at the kink when it turns. Yes, so proline is famous for amino acid turns. So it will end a secondary structure. It'll disrupt the secondary structure and it will cause the primary sequence to turn around. That's what we mean by turns. So that's proline and then Q. A couple of different ways people will remember which amino acid corresponds to Q. One thing we could say is that, I like this a lot. Glutamine is Q-tamine. Glutamine is Q-tamine. It's a cutie. Um, another way that I used to remember this by was to say that, well, if G was already taken by glycine, What's the next closest letter, at least the way it looks to G, is big Q. So that's how I, I want to say that's probably what they did. <laughs> and the, the N, how do I remember the N? Well, similar to asparagine, glutamine is a glutamate with an NH2 instead of an OH on its carbonyl. And then after Q, we get R. And R is for arginine. And I think you really do need to make sure to do that, <laughs> the, little, the little pirate thing that I did. Uh, I like to say, what's a pirate's favorite amino acid? Arginine. And arginine is going to be another base. Um, we'll go over some mnemonics for these as well. So there's arginine and then S is gonna be for serine. Serine is gonna be our, one of our polar friends.
And at this point, we want to mention a couple things. Serine is like cysteine, but with an OH instead of an SH. The other thing we want to remember is what are the three amino acids who are most often phosphorylated? What are the three amino acids that are most often phosphorylated? So my mnemonic for this, yeah. I didn't catch your answer. Sorry, those three has hydroxyl, one of the like phenol one and other two just with the hydroxyl. Perfect, yeah. So the three most often are gonna be serine, uh, threonine and tyrosine, S-T-Y. So um, one, one mnemonic that I came up with for this was, um, when we think of a phosphate, like an inorganic phosphate, we'll often see that denoted as P sub I, or like P with a little I. Um, actually, it's, that's not the part, it's in parentheses. So PI for a phosphate. And then G is nothing, it's just there to make the mononic work. But I like to say pigsty for the three that are most commonly phosphorylated. Now, is it true that there are more amino acids that can be phosphorylated? Yes. You should go though always with STY on the MCAT. But if you understand your organic chemistry, you should understand that any amino acid with a nucleophilic side chain can potentially be phosphorylated. But like I said, for the MCAT, we're gonna go with serine, threonine, and tyrosine. Any questions before I erase this and we finish up with the 20 amino acids? Try to lean in so if anybody wants a screenshot. All right. And then our last batch. So after S comes T, T is for three anine. Three anine, likewise, we said has hydroxyl, it's polar. And we could say that three anine is serine with a methyl. T, um, and then so elemental P, Q, R, S, T, U, V. So there's no U, we're gonna go to V. V is gonna, V is nice, V is very nice, valine. And what do we like, what do we like about valine with regards to the V? Its side chain is isopropyl which looks like a V. And then W will be tryptophan. Um, and tryptophan is gonna be another nonpolar. Tryptophan is the heaviest amino acid. It's also aromatic and the, no, the mnemonic that my biochemistry undergrad professor used for tryptophan was he liked to say it like a baby. Tryptophan. You know how like babies and like toddlers, like it takes them a few years to like turn W into R. So tryptophan. And there's no X. And then Y will be tyrosine. And tyrosine. We can say probably is a Y because the they didn't have they ran out of T's so they again had to come up with tricky or or, or clever ways to think of one letter abbreviations so they went with the Y for tyrosine um, is tyrosine polar or nonpolar? How do you divide a room of biochemists? Ask them if tyrosine is polar or nonpolar. The answer is yes. The answer to my either or question is yes. Um, and what do I mean by that? So tyrosine, this is a, we'll actually draw the structure 
of the R group here. So the MCAT's never going to ask you is tyrosine polar or nonpolar? And here's why. It has the hydroxyl group, which we know can be phosphorylated. It can also hydrogen bond. That's a very strong intermolecular force, but it also has a very bulky aromatic benzene ring. So really, tyrosine straddles the definition between nonpolar and polar. Remember, the cell or the body does not care what us as humans have come up with for cl classifications and categories. If tyrosine works in this position in this protein, the cell does not care whether we as humans call it polar or nonpolar. So this is what I like to say is another case of us trying to impose order or systematization or categorization onto chaos, which is nature. So where, how are you likely to be asked about tyrosine's polarity of its side chain? Um, well, compared to phenylalanine, is tyrosine more polar or less? Compared to phenylalanine, tyrosine is more polar. It has the hydroxyl. Oh, there's supposed to be a dupe dupe. There we go. Um, compared to serine or threonine, is tyrosine more polar or less polar? Or we could say more nonpolar or less nonpolar. Compared to serine and, and threonine, this guy is going to be less polar. So that's the, the type of way that you could be asked about this, the classification of tyrosine. Like I'm gonna call it polar right now, but of course we know it would be more nonpolar than other groups containing a hydroxyl. Let me know if you have any, if that can clarify that at all, or if that makes sense. And in terms of structure of the side chain, we could say it's a phenylalanine with OH group, or we could say it's a phenol as one of you mentioned earlier. And that's it, no Z in our amino acid alphabet either. So a couple of extra, a couple of other things we can say. My favorite mnemonic for the basic amino acids and one that I think everybody should memorize is his lies are basic. So his lies are basic. So I really like this mnemonic. A, it's very cute and easy to remember. Uh, oh, I guess it's not. What am I doing? <laughs> They're right there. I was like, let's underline the one letter abbreviations. No, um, his lies are basic. So the other thing I really like about this mnemonic is that towards the word basic, we have increasing basicity, increasing basicity towards the word basic. So it's very, very handy. Um, some people will ask me, Charlie, should I memorize the PKAs of the acidic and basic amino acids? You can memorize them if you like. You would really only need to know the relative acidity and basicity. So this is sufficient without memorizing PKAs. If you wanted to memorize PKAs, I would memorize 6.0, 10.5, and 12.5 are the side chains for the basic ones. And then aspartic acid and glutamic acid, it's like, I wanna say 3.65 and 4.35. Um, I'm not hundred percent sure on those. So don't quote me, even though this is literally going to be in a YouTube video, uh, but if yeah, that would, that's what it's in my head. I'm pretty sure that's correct. Um, but what you do need to know is the relative acidity and basicity. So you need to know that aspartic acid is more acidic than glutamic acid. And then you need to know this order here. Any questions before we move on to amino acid synthesis? We'll cover the Strecker and the Gabriel. All right, so a question I get all the time is, Charlie, do I need to memorize the steps of the Strecker and Gabriel synthesis? My answer tends to be no, because at least when I used to work for my previous MCAT company, not my current MCAT company, I'm not gonna name any names, but I'm not gonna trash any of them either. Um, 
And I used to work for my previous MCAT company who I wrote these lectures for originally. What they told us the purpose of including the Strecker and the Gabriel synthesis and, and also the purpose of why they're in the books is to have that background of amino acid structure. What we're gonna use these Strecker and Gabriel synthesis for is to reinforce amino acid structure. And they said not that students should know, uh, not the students should know the individual steps. And then, so we're also reinforcing a lot of our OCHEM reactions. So you're gonna recognize every step for the most part of these syntheses are gonna be reactions we covered in our previous videos. And so that's what I would use these syntheses for. I wouldn't necessarily say that you should memorize them, um, particularly like the structures of the Gabriel synthesis are kind of wild. You will see UWorld questions if you're um, somebody who uses that resource, which is a very good one um, that actually do require and probably from some other um, third party companies as well. We'll actually like have questions that test you on the details of these syntheses. But again, so that's that's my two cents on it anyway. You can take that any way you like. Um, do I expect you to have questions that test content on Strecker and Gabriel synthesis? No. Um, should you memorize them? If you have the if you have the wavelength, there's so not the wavelength, if you have the bandwidth, then the space in your brain, go ahead. If not, I like to say save that for psych <laughs> All right. So the Strecker synthesis starts with an aldehyde where the R group is gonna to correspond to the R group of our amino acid. Step one is going to be ammonia with catalytic H plus. And what functional group is formed when we react an aldehyde or a ketone with ammonia or a primary amine? What functional group is formed? We covered this two videos ago now in the addition section. So for anybody who wants to brush up, this is part of our addition reactions and it's called an imine. Step two of the Strecker synthesis uses sodium cyanide and H plus, or some sources will just say hydrocyanic acid, HCN. And CN minus, super good nucleophile. I think we've already hammered in the detail that in cyanide, the negative charge of the nucleophilic site is the carbon, not the nitrogen. And so our CN minus will attack our partially positive carbon of the, of the imine, and it will do an addition reaction. And this was this is a version. This is similar to the cyanohydrin reaction. If you've seen that before, and so this is what our our uh, molecule will look like after that. Then the last step of the Strecker synthesis is acid and heat. And what this is going to do is it's going to hydrolyze the nitrile. I don't remember if we actually covered nitrile hydrolysis. It's a decent reaction to add to your list of reactions. I don't know if you, I would call it like a core reaction. In nitrile hydrolysis, what you do want to know if, again, you have the space, is that the nitrile will get hydrolyzed into a carboxylic acid. So we could say similar to like acid hydrolysis of amides, for instance. And then we have now our amino acid in its most protonated form. So question for you, can this produce a pure enantiomer, pure L enantiomer. And this process produce a pure L enantiomer, the kind that we might like to use in our body. So 
So let's see. So normally, right, we said that our alpha carbon is the chiral carbon in the amino acid. It doesn't look like I drew any stereochemistry, but let's follow that alpha carbon back to the original molecule. So we have on our alpha carbon, in our original molecule, it was sp2, 120 degrees planar. In the next step, it was also sp2, 120 degrees planar. Here's where it becomes sp3. Here's where it becomes sp3. So an sp3 carbon, we can have stereochemistry. However, this cyanide molecule, when it attacks the imine in our second step, it's not gonna like choose, because this, remember this planar, it doesn't choose to come in from one direction versus the opposite direction. This isn't like an SN2 reaction where you have to do a backside attack or you can't do your SN2 reaction. Um, so then it does produce a, a racemic mixture here. And then we didn't change the stereochemistry or anything here either. So the answer is no, this would produce a racemic mixture. What process would we need to do to make a pure L amino acid? from this racemic mixture. Which separation technique would we apply to separate a racemic mixture out? What is the name of that process that, that uh, separates a racemic mixture of amino acids into their pure enantiomers? So the answer is resolution. So you'll see this in my OCHEM separation techniques part two video. So resolution, you do need to know, is the separation technique, the only separation technique that produces, that, uh, that can separate out a racemic mixture. Any questions on the Strecker synthesis? Good, good. I'm gonna erase five, four. Sorry, can you yes. can you explain again why is it that um, a racemic mixture is not produced? It is produced and not a pure enantiomer. Yeah. So to get a pure enantiomer, there's there's a few different ways to get a pure enantiomer in um, in in chemistry and in biological chemistry. So to to produce a pure enantiomer through reactions. One way is to start with a pure enantiomer and then only do reactions that preserve the stereochemistry of that enantiomer or SN2 reaction type reactions that invert the stereochemistry. So that'd be one way to get a pure enantiomer at the end of a reaction. Um, there's, there's another way that, the, that you'll encounter in sophomore undergrad organic chemistry, but not in MCAT organic chemistry, most likely, unless it's tested as part of a passage where you have ample explanation. But you can also put on other groups to your molecule that have stereochemistry that somehow, we're gonna leave it there, force the stereochemistry to be one way. So like the, the example that comes to mind is like, um, you, might, you might have like, let's say I have a center here and I want, it to be, I want it to be away from you towards me. I could put a, uh, a, an isopropyl group on the next door neighbor carbon so that there's no room for my reagents to put the methyl group going towards you. So it has to be towards me. That could be another way of getting um, pure, a pure like an antiomer in an organic chemistry, like lab setting. And then in biological chemistry, uh, where we're using enzymes to catalyze reactions. So enzymes are great. They're, they're excellent at producing pure diastereomers and enantiomers. Um, because when you're in an enzyme, you have an active site. So you have a whole, you have a whole team of different amino acids with different positions, different local positions where, you know, you get your amino acids that are on this side of the active site to do this step. And so this struct, this uh, functional group points this direction. You get your amino acids on this side of the active site to do this step. So then the, uh, the new group that you put on is going this direction. So to answer your question, 
Um, those are the main ways that you can get like pure enantiomers, pure diastereomers in organic chemistry. And we just haven't done any of those things here. Um, and then to be very specific about this, this reaction and why it produces a racemic mixture is that we have a planar structure, which has no stereochem. We have a planar structure which has no stereochem. We do not have a planar structure. We have a tetrahedral, we have a tetrahedral center here uh, produced this tetrahedral center is produced when cyanide attacks the carbon of the imine. However, there's no reason for that cyanide to attack from the front or to attack from the back because this is a planar center. And then there's nothing that we do in this step that would allow us to have stereochem. So I hope I answered your question. Let me know if I did not. Yeah, you did. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Oh, um, very good question though. Like, and that's, there's an AMC question out there um, there's an AMC question out there that asks in step such and such of such and such reaction scheme, how was stereochemistry produced? And the answer is it was catalyzed by an enzyme. So that's, that is a kind of question that you should be thinking. And that's why it's a great question because it does tie into stuff that I know the AMC loves to test. So with that, uh, we're gonna move on to the Gabriel synthesis. which has some very fun structures. The full name of Gabriel synthesis is the Gabriel Melonic Ester synthesis. And so in the Gabriel synthesis, our starting molecule is this, which is, um, you'll probably see a U-world question if you go through all the U-world organic chemistry, is a derivative of, thal of something called thalamide. Again, like I said, I don't think you need to know the spe specifics of the syntheses like this, but if you, you'll see that U-world question, you'll remember this name. So the first step in the Gabriel synthesis we use a strong base such as potassium hydroxide. And at that point, we're able to deprotonate this amide hydrogen. Amides, we're seeing an amide get deprotonated. Are amides good acids? Are they willing, are they usually willing to give up the amide hydrogen? Are amides good acids? And the answer is no, they aren't. Amides are very, very poor acids and bases. They're, they really do neither function very well. So then what is it about this structure that allows us to deprotonate the nitrogen? The carbonyls. Yes, and are we talking? What is the uh, what is the name of the electronic effect that stabilizes this conjugate? So resonance, right? I'm not going to draw them for the sake of time. We could draw at least two really good resonance structures where the lone pair on the nitrogen is withdrawn to the carbonyl or withdrawn to this carbonyl. And there's some very minor resonance structures which involve carbon ions on this benzene ring. Um, but suffice it to say that we have a highly conjugated system. In fact, it's entirely conjugated at this point. Um, and so that can help stabilize this conjugate base very well. So that's how we've turned, we've used a very strong base and we've taken a molecule that has lots of potential for resonance structures. And that's why we're allowed to uh, to actually deprotonate this guy. And then our next step, what we're gonna add is, I'm gonna have to circle back down here. And our next step, what we add is,
is this guy. Um, these are just some, some generic R groups. I don't know, let's make them ETs. So we don't get confused between a generic R group, which is not the focus of this reaction versus the R group of the amino acid, which is the focus of this reaction. So uh, what possible reactions could we have between this nitrogen that we just set up, which has an anion and this structure that we just added? What type of reactions are possible? Do we have any good, what, uh, how could this nitrogen act? Could this nitrogen act as a acid base, nucleophile, electrophile, donating group, leaving group? Um, <laughs> yeah, what is this nitrogen gonna like to act as? Oxidizing agent, reducing agent. Substitution reaction, very nice, yes. So we have, a, we have a nucleophilic nitrogen and we have a good leaving group with that BR. So our nitrogen is gonna do an SN2 reaction with the carbon attached to that BR. We thought the structure was looking complicated already. And that's what we have now. I've simplified the way that I'm drawing these, but they're still the same asters. And now we could call this carbon the alpha carbon. Make a better alpha for you. Call this carbon the alpha carbon. And now, when we know we know from addition reactions and enolates that alpha carbons are slightly acidic with a pKa of around 20. And what we can do now is add. a strong base. I'm gonna have this come back a little more towards me <laughs> for the sake of my back. And then step two, after we add our strong base, now we will add our R group. So we'll start by deprotonating this alpha hydrogen, turning it into, car turning the carbon into carbanion. And again, what the, the carbons, the alpha hydrogens, usually not that acidic. However, like the amide, we have a lot of potential for forming resonance structures. So, uh, and in fact, even more potential because of these groups up here. And so that's what's gonna help allow this to happen. And now we can have this and we can add our R group. starting to get lazy. <laughs> and then uh, our last step is going to be strong acid concentrated as well with heat. And on our last, we're gonna do a heck of a lot of things. So for starters, our acid is going to hydrolyze a bunch of different bonds. Now hydrolyze a bunch of different bonds. So we're going to hydrolyze these amides. We're going to hydrolyze the carboxylic acids and sorry, the esters into carboxylic acids. Oops, that's all gone now. And now what we're going to have is two carboxylic acids on our alpha carbon. And then heat is also going to do something. So what heat is doing is heat, as we saw in our last lecture, when we have a beta uh, carboxylic acid, it doesn't matter which one this happens to, 
because they're indistinguishable. We'll do a decarboxylation reaction. And then finally, we will be at our amino acid. And hydrogen will replace the CO2. And we will have our final product. So that's a Gabriel synthesis. Saw a lot of reactions that we'd seen before. We have an acid-base acid deprotonation for starters. We've got some resonance structures in there. Um, we did an SN2 reaction. Let me actually indicate what an SN2 reaction. We deprotonated an alpha carbon. We had another SN2 reaction happen. Um, we had amide hydrolysis, ester hydrolysis, decarboxylation. And you can see why somebody might, like somebody might write a book uh, for MCAT prep where we studied all of the reactions in here and then you know, show you a synthesis that includes lots and lots of reactions. So that's why I include this in my lecture, even though, like I said, I don't think you'd be tested on specific details. So any questions on the Gabriel? What kind of questions can you get from this? Um, you could be tested on like any of the reactions or like resonance properties and alpha carbon acidity. Like you can be tested on any of that stuff. Uh, would you get on the actual MCAT questions about specifics of the Gabriel synthesis? I think not. I think it would not be worth it to memorize all of this like as a whole process. So that's why I say, we go over these to, um, to reinforce amino acid structure questions, which will absolutely be possible, or amino acid structure, which you could absolutely possibly get questions about, um, as well as a bunch of uh, properties and reactions that we do see tested all the time on the MCAT. Um, but like I said, I've, I haven't heard of this being tested in specific detail on the MCAT before. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> All right, and now I'm going to erase the Gabriel synthesis. Oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> One last question. Same question that we did before. Can we produce a, an antimerically pure L amino acid from this? Can we produce an antimerically pure L amino acid from this? The answer here, not surprisingly probably to you, is no. So, so for starters, let's follow our alpha carbon. So our alpha carbon was here. Is that a stereo center? Is that a stereo center? No, not yet. Because we have two of the same groups on the left and the right side. Our alpha carbon here, is that a stereo center? Still no, still got those two same groups. Where is our alpha carbon now? Alpha carbon's here. Still have the same two groups. Our alpha carbon's here. We still have the same two groups. The only, the only point at which this alpha carbon even becomes a chiral center with four unique substituent groups is after the decarboxylation has happened. And, after the, decarb and the decarboxylation is not stereospecific in any way. It could be either of these carboxylic acids who leaves. Uh, because these carboxylic acids, as we established, are identical. They're, they, that's why we could not have a stereocenter at any of these earlier points. And so because the decarboxylation is not stereospecific, we can't get an antimerically pure amino acid. And if we wanted to get an antimerically pure amino acid, we would proceed the same way and we would do, uh, we would perform resolution to, to separate these enantiomers out from each other. Um, and then we would finally have our D and our L enantiomers. Any last minute questions on Gabriel synthesis before I erase in five, four, three, two, one. Cool. All right. So now we're going to start talking about the peptide bond. Oh, no, sorry. We're going to talk about amino acid acid base properties.
New asset asset base properties. So we'll start with uh, redrawing a generic amino acid here. And let's talk about the termini. So by the way, when you, when you do write your amino acid from N to C terminus, as we often do, and as uh, every, every resource that ever talks about peptides will do, if you draw it like this with your R group on the top and on a wedge, that'll be an L amino acid. So you could potentially have a question that wants to know if this is an L amino acid or a D amino acid, um, or maybe they show it to you in a different way. So it is helpful to, um, to have that in the back of your head. And now, so we have the N terminus who's gonna be basic, as we said. Does anybody know what the PKA roughly of the N terminus is? Uh, that'd be the C. Uh, that would be for histidine side chain. So the N terminus, the best value that I would memorize would be 9.5, around 9.5. The C terminus is acidic with a pKa of about two to 2.5. I like just using 2.5 and 9.5, because then, I don't know, something about the 0.5 makes it stick a little better for some reason. So we could say about amino acids is that they are amphoteric. You know, amphoteric means that you can have, you can act as either an acid or a base. All amino acids will have two or more pKa values. So for the acidic amino acids and basic amino acids, three pKa's. For the ionizable side chains. And ionizable here in this context, the way I'm using ionizable, uh, it can be used to say, to mean acidic and or basic. Uh, so if you're ever looking for a term that says acidic and basic or acidic or basic, you can use ionizable. And now at physiological pH, What is physiological pH? What is physiological pH? 7.4. So physiological pH of 7.4 can draw one of our pH versus pKa uh, charts. We could say about a carboxylic acid versus an amine. We know that when H plus is low, sorry, when pH is low, we know that H plus is high. When we know that when pH is high, H plus is low. And so for a carboxylic acid, when it's protonated, it's going to be COOH. And when it's deprotonated, it's going to be COO minus. And so in terms of charge, we're going to assign a neutral charge for the carboxylic acid when pH is below 2.5-ish and a negative charge when pH is above 2.5-ish. The amino group works a little bit differently. When the amino group is protonated, which is when pH is less than 
then we know that the charge would be plus one. When the amino group is deprotonated or pH is above 9.5, our amino group will be neutral. So therefore we can figure out what would be the charge at all of these different points for our generic amino acid with no acidic or basic side chain. So at a pH of one, at a pH of one, what we could say is that we have a neutral for our carboxylic acid. We have a plus for our amino group. So charge would be positive one at a pH of 14. We could say that our amino group is deprotonated, so we get a neutral for that. Our carboxylic acid group is deprotonated, so we get a minus one for that. So the net charge will be minus one. Um, I'm actually gonna write down as well the little symbols for us here. So we remember why and where these are coming from. Carboxylic acid would be negative. The amino would be neutral and the charge would be minus one. At a physiological pH of 7.4, what would be the net charge of an amino acid with no acidic or basic side chain? And our net charge would then be zero. We would have a, we would take the negative from the carboxyl group. We would take the positive from the amino group. Uh, negative, positive, charge is neutral. And in what form What's the term for when a group, when a when a molecule has both negative and positive charges? When a molecule has both negative and positive charges, we call that a Zwitter ion. Excellent. So our structure of our amino acid at physiological pH, our generic one, would look like. Look like this. And we would call this a Zwitter ion. Which has both positive and negative charges. Any questions so far? All right, so I'm gonna erase a little bit up top here. So we can talk about PI. So PI will be the isoelectric point not to be confused with isoelectronic which are two elements that have the same electron configuration, two species with the same electron configuration. Um, and at the, at the, what do we define as the isoelectric point? It's the pH at which, pH at which the net charge is exactly zero on a molecule. And for non-ionizable side chains, or for, yeah, for non, yeah, ionizable side chains, which we said means not acidic or basic. The PI is gonna be around 
six. Let's prove that using alanine. So now our R group is in methyl. The pKa of the N-terminus of alanine is 9.69 and the C-terminus is 2.34. So if we add these two guys together, I'm running out of room. <laughs> um, am I good to erase over here? I feel, I don't think we need anything really else from over here. Um, but do take note that our PI which our pH is around six is halfway between 2.5 and 9.5. I, I used to do these lectures on like massive whiteboards. So I had a lot, I planned for a lot more space than I have now at home. So, um, so PI is the average of the two pKa's between which the net charge is zero. It's the average of the two pKa's between which the molecules net charge is zero. For non-ionizable side chains, that's just the average of the N and C termini. or acidic, it's the average between the two acids. So the, uh, so the side chain and the C-terminus. For the basic amino acids, it's the average between the two bases. It shouldn't be immediately obvious to you why this is the case. And we don't really have time to go into it in this video. So if you're curious as to why this is the case, you're not just memorizing it, I would advise you to take an acidic and a basic amino acid and draw them, draw all four, there are four potential structures of that amino acid, depending on its pH and, its, and the pKa's. So I would draw like a titration series for the acidic and basic amino acids. If you would like to prove this to yourself rather than simply memorizing it, which is always better. And unfortunately we just don't have time. So then for our alanine, we could say that it's PI is 9.69 plus 2.34 over two. And if we add those together, so what I would do when I'm adding something like that together is I would give the 0.34 to the 9.69 and that gets you to 10. So actually it ends up being 10 plus two divided by two, 12 over two, six. And I don't really think this is something you should memorize that the PI for non isosceles bubble side change is six, um, but here's why that's the case. All right, any questions before we move on to a practice problem or two practice problems? All right, so let's set up our two practice problems. And for the road ahead of us, what we have left today is going to be um, peptide bond formation. I'll talk about the peptide bond for a moment, peptide bond hydrolysis, the three le four levels of protein structure, disulfide linkages and protein denaturation. So that's what we have left for today after we get through these two practice problems. And how are we doing on time? Oh, you know what? We're it's starting to get a little long. So we may, um, we may stop somewhere before that. We'll stop, we'll stop with, um, we'll stop before protein structure. And then um, next class, we'll talk about 
uh, the four levels of protein structure, um, protein denaturation, disulfide linkages, lipids, um, and sugars. And that should hopefully be roughly equal way to divide this lesson. There's just so much on proteins and amino acids. Okay, so for example, for the dipeptide, for the dipeptide, ASP, HIS, estimate the PI and net charge at pH equals one, eight and 12. And you're given PKA of R groups, for ASP is 3.65, and for HIS, 6.04. That's a lot of stretching. <laughs> All right, so let's, we're actually gonna tackle this together. I know I called it a practice problem, and it will be. It'll be good practice. Um, I would definitely, if you're at home, like taking notes and following along other than just watching, I would definitely practice drawing this. This will help, this will help you out a lot, um, potentially on, on the NCAT. If you, if you encounter like pH in that charge, uh, it will help you, it'll help you know it without memorizing. And so remember, we don't just have these two side chains. We also have the N and the C termini. Remember. Peptides and proteins are always written from N to C terminus. Always, always. So we're going to put our 3.65. I'm going to put it above. I'm not even going to write PKA. You know it's a PKA. So 3.65 for aspartic acid side chain, 6.04 for a histidine side chain. We'll just use a generic two for our C terminus and a 9.5 for our N terminus. And so this was the C term. This was the ASP R group. This was the histidine R group. And this was the N term. And so recall from earlier, uh, as we always say, when pH is low, H plus is high. When H plus is high, pH is low. So for our carboxylic acids, when pH is low, they will be in the COOH form. When pH is high, they'll be in the COO minus form. So neutral and negative. And I'm not going to write it again. Neutral and negative. What does it mean for pH to be high? or for pH to be low in the context in which we're using it? Well, it just means relative. Compared to that pKa of two, a pH of one is low and a pH of three is high. For this pKa of six, a pH of four is low, a pH of eight is high, and so on and so forth. So when we say high and low, um, we are remembering that these are in their individual contexts rather than just a general description of high and low pH. Um, we know that for, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna try to show the deprotonated and protonated forms of the histidine R group because that's not gonna fit at all. Uh, but remember for the nitrogen bases, when they, are, when they are protonated, they get a positive charge. When they are deprotonated, they have a negative, uh, a neutral charge. So we'll put positive, Neutral, positive, neutral. And now we can just put everything together. So 
starting with our, it's a good color to use here, um, orange, uh, purple, uh, whatever, orange. So for our pH of one, we are right here. And so how does this work again? We, for each pKa, we've got to account for all four. For each pKa, we simply use the side and the charge on the side that is closer to the given pH. So for this pKa of two, we're going to choose the left side because we're to the left and neutral. The pKa of 3.65, we're going to choose the left side because we're closer to the left side. Um, and we're on the left side of everybody. So we're getting a positive charge for histidine. So this is where a histidine could be protonated. In fact, anywhere below like six or really around five is when you start to get full, you know, most of your histidine's protonated. So neutral, neutral, positive, positive. Our net charge is going to be plus two. What about at our pH of eight? What would be the net charge of our dipeptide at a pH of eight? So we would say positive for this guy, the end terminus, neutral for the histidine, and then minus minus for the two as acids. And so our net charge in green, minus minus plus, and we get a minus one. And then at 12, lastly, We will have the right side for everybody. So minus, minus, neutral, neutral. And then our net charge will be minus two. So between which two PKAs? Will we find our isoelectric point? Between which two pKa's will we find our isoelectric point? So one, one trick you can kind of use, by the way, with this technique is once you have all of your groups written down, with the corresponding charges. Like you don't have to do this circle method that we did here for each and every one of them. In fact, if we think about this from the perspective of a titration, we're gonna start off of course with our plus two, like we said. And every time, just like in a titration, when we pass by a pKa to an equivalence point, we're deprotonating one hydrogen from one group. And so we're deprotonating the hydrogen from the C-terminus. So between here and here, we have deprotonated the C terminus. And so we lose a plus one every time. So no, you don't have to go through all of these different ones. As soon as you, and in fact, if you wanna make this really, really simple, what you can do is you can count the number of bases. Which was two. Count the number of bases, which was two. That's your charge when at the most acidic. And so without even, without even accounting for everything, we could say, okay, the charge at the most acidic is plus two. And then you can say, okay, I have every TKA I, I cross, I'm losing an H plus, I'm losing a plus one charge and I'm becoming more negative. Um, so those are some tricks that you can use to sort of facilitate your use of this uh, technique. And so our PI is gonna be, be found between 3.65 and 6.4, or is gonna be the average, the literal average of those two. So I would say, I don't know, 
and six. So 9.5 over two, which is what? 4.75 of VRPI. Okay, so that's a uh, practice problem number one. Um, it was a dipeptide net charge problem. And AMC loves these kind of these kind of problems. Of course, when you're being asked about physiological pH, remember, you can always say, um, with the exception of histidine, acids are negative at physiological, bases are positive at physiological. Histidine and the rest of the amino acids, the rest of the, what is that, 15 more rest of the amino acids, plus histidine are all neutral at physiological. So that's where I would, that's where I would do shortcuts if you're, if you're using a physiological pH. If they were to ask you at pHs other than physiological, such as one or 12, that's where a method like this becomes more useful. Any questions before we uh, throw on the next uh, practice problem? It should be a little less, uh, a little less cumbersome. I'm gonna erase in five. Charlie, I had a question. It's about when is the time we added similar to number? Is that the same thing? What is the time where um, we, add, we add and make the average like two similar number? If it's acidic, like you know, lower two number. If it's basic, the higher two number. Oh, um, for a for a, a single amino acid. Oh, okay, that's for yeah, a single. I'm finding the PI of a single amino acid. So yeah, it was around here somewhere before, I think is what you're referencing. It was for mm -hmm. non-ionizable side chains. You take the average of the two uh, and the NNC termini. For acidic, mm -hmm. you take the average of the two acids. For basic, you take the average of the two bases. So that's for a, that's for a single amino acid. Um, and that would work for a dipeptide. Okay, and dipeptide, we need to consider both. Yeah, or, a, or an oligopeptide. You would need to consider more than two even. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Great questions. All right. Um, so the PI in the previous problem we found was 4.75. Excuse me. So if we were to, that was, sorry. If we were to take a gel, which has a, pH gradient has a pH gradient. Oh, let's look at H, it's supposed to be 14. A gel with a pH gradient, this is called an isoelectric focusing gel. You take an isoelectric focusing gel and we that's supposed to be a pipette. <laughs> so we put our dipeptide from before into the middle of our isoelectric focusing gel. And we have a negative side on the left and a positive side on the right. By the way, would this be a negative anode or a negative cathode? Anode is positive. But what is your question again? Oh, that was my question. So, yeah, so um, basically the, the question behind the question is do we have a galvanic cell or an electrolytic cell? Okay, if it's galvanic, then anode is positive. Oh, no, if it's galvanic, they, they are what they sound like. So in a galvanic cell, you're negative anode, you're positive cathode. Electrolytic is where they're the opposite of what they sound like. And do y'all remember doing gels? Did you, how do you know if you have an electrolytic cell? If there's a voltage, you immediate, if there's a, like a battery, a voltage source, you immediately know that you have an electrolytic cell. And do you guys, do y'all remember doing um, gels in like your undergrad labs, your prereqs? 
you remember a hook? There was a voltage source hooked up or not? Oh yeah, always with oh, the yeah, definitely. with the blue and sorry, yep. the red, black. Yeah, yeah, with the red and the black leads, perfect. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that tells us that all of the gels that we run in, and this is SDS page, agarose gel electrophoresis, um, like isoelectric focusing, are all electrolytic cells, cathode, anode. So is this, um, which direction is our, is our dipeptide going to migrate if we place it in the middle at a pH of seven? So oh, the you know, cathode? Hold on, let's get rid of that. <laughs> um, I realized that I didn't think that through, but we do know there's a pH of seven here. And so what we could say, I think I had made, I had made it too obvious. And I also remember that I didn't write this problem originally with the pH is specified. So I wanna make sure that I didn't mess it up. Uh, I don't know if that, if any of that will make sense until we're done with the problem. So I also have a version of our chart for, um, for PI. And what's a little bit different is it's not like protonated, deprotonated. It's positive, neutral, and negative. So when pH is low, H plus is high. When pH is high, H plus is low. So then at our pH of seven, we'd be over here. We know that when pH is equal to PI, charge is zero. We know that when pH is less than PI, we have an excess of protons relative to our PI. So we'll have a net positive charge. When our pH is greater than our PI, we'll have a deficiency of protons relative to our PI. And so we'll have a negative charge. So oh yeah, I did, I did mess it up when I wrote the pHs on there. I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> um, so our net charge actually be negative at a pH of seven because we have a greater pH than PI. And so we're going to migrate to which side? The anode? Towards the anode, yeah. So I could have told you the pH or the anode and cathode and you would have been able to find it out either way. It just so happens that I had the gradient in the wrong direction. So that, that's what I had messed up earlier. And yeah, so it's gonna migrate until it reaches pH of 4.75. Any questions on our isoelectric focusing problem? Can you re-explain the pH part? Uh, specifically? The, the bottom half of... Um, that part, yes. Yeah. All right. So the way that this one works, so we had a version for PKA, which would tell you whether a group was protonated or deprotonated. And so we call our definition of PI is, so PI is going to work a little differently. Um, recall with the Henderson Hasselbach equation, which if you need more background on that, you'll have to wait until Gen Chem lecture five. That's right. Charlie's going to do Gen Chem after this, um, and we'll go over the Henderson Hasselbach in our acids and bases lecture. And so, um, when pH is equal to pKa, you have a 50 50 mixture of conjugate acid and conjugate base. And so, um, it's not the same really as when you have, like, let's, let's, um, let me stop talking and in, in, um, start, start talking in specifics. So, let's say we had a carboxylic acid. We know to the left of the pKa, when pH is low, it will be protonated. To the right, it will be deprotonated. So, but in the middle, we're going to be 50 50. So, really, you have to go maybe about a pH unit, and then 90% of your uh, amino acids will be neutral, and 10% will be negative. If you go a pH unit above, and ninety percent of your, uh, and I'm, by the way, that's not a that's not a random number that comes from somewhere. We just don't have really have time to get into it today. 
um, 90 percent of your amino acids will, your, your carboxylic acids will be deprotonated at a pH equals pKa. We'll have 50 percent neutral, 50 percent negative, so the charge will be minus a half at the pKa when pH is equal to pKa. So that's sort of like what happens to the left in the middle and to the right when it comes to pKa. With pI, we know that when pH is equal to the pI, by definition, the net charge is zero. So as soon as we lower the pH relative to the pK to pI, we're adding excess H plus. When your pH is equal to pI, you have the perfect amount of H plus. It's, it's so perfect because let's say you have 20 um, acidic groups and 20 basic groups. At your PI, you're gonna get half, you're gonna get all of the acids, or, or I don't know, enough of them where it's like it completely balances out all of those side chains or, or groups to a to a, having a net charge of zero. So as soon as you start to mess with that, as soon as you start to lower pH, you're adding an excess of H plus relative to your PI. And so you get a positive net charge. As soon as you raise your pH above your what your PI is. You're, you're, you no longer have the perfect balance of H plus. And so we're gonna have net deprotonation occur and we'll have a net negative charge. So that um, that's, should be how it works. Um, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, so then at our, yeah, so that was it for this problem. Um, and then let's go ahead and move on to our last topic of the day, which is gonna be the peptide bond. Being on time. Okay. Looks like it's going to be about a two-hour video today. <laughs> For everybody who's just getting to this point in the video, <laughs> watching this on YouTube right now, uh, y'all are y'all are champs for sticking around, um, and and y'all who are in our, at our live class today, y'all are champs for sticking around too. I know it's been a lot. So, lastly, we'll knock this off with uh, protein synthesis, or I guess peptide synthesis, and reactivity. So if we take two amino acids, uh, so the first thing we actually want to mention is amino, amino acids in proteins are linked by the peptide bond. What OCHEM functional group is a peptide bond? What OCHEM functional group is a peptide bond? And am I good? Am I? And so we have two generic amino acids. two amino acids, we can form a peptide bond via, is it hydrolysis or condensation? Hydrolysis? So it's actually gonna be, we're gonna lose water when we form this bond because our carbonyl is gonna be bonded to our nitrogen. So we're gonna lose water which we know as condensation. The condensation reaction, it's also, yeah.
I don't know if you can hear me, but we can't hear you. Oh shoot, I had partially unplugged my headphones. That's what happened. That's what had happened. What was the last thing that you heard? Other than my cat. <laughs> I lost you after you drew the structure, honestly. Oh, okay, okay. So um, so recall that in um, in from OCHEM Fundamental Toolkit Part One, we know that lone pairs can act as, as resonance donating groups electron donating groups and carbonyls can act as in resonance um, electron withdrawing groups. And so that's what's going to happen when we form a minor resonance structure contributor. Oh, our mascot's here. Hey, buddy, I'm going to be off really soon. You can't jump on my shoulders right now. You can sit down. Good cat. Nope. Down. Good boy. Thank you. See, he knows when class is about to be over, I swear. He's like, what does that mean? So here's our other our other resident structure. No, you can't sit on my shoulders, my dude. He wants to, he wants to be a scarf. It's too early. So um we have is a conjugated system here. We have a conjugated system from the nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen of the carbonyl. And what that means is that everybody who's bonded to everybody who's bonded to these guys, so six atoms actually, in no particular order, one, two, three. Or, no, he's, he's, he's like making the calculations to, to jump on me. He's right here. Um, he's good. Oh, he'll have all my attention later. Uh, four, five, and six. All six of these atoms are planar, are planar. And because they're conjugated and planar, none of these bonds, one to two, two to three, four, five, six, none of the bonds in this box can rotate. Uh, you may recall from biochemistry the phi and the psi uh, bonds and the Ramachandran plots. Unfortunately, we don't need to know. I said, fortunately, <laughs> we don't need to know that for the MCAT. Um, but the, the two bonds that can rotate, and see, I don't even remember which one's which. The two bonds that can rotate are those guys. So those bonds can rotate, and that's what gives proteins their ability to form secondary tertiary structures as opposed to just being like a, a planar chain of peptide bonds. So, so this, is, this is the part of the, of the uh, peptide that is, uh, that is structurally rigid. And these are the two places where we can rotate. Any questions on, oh, and then uh, atoms, so atoms uh, two, three, and four are sp2, 120 degrees. Any questions on anything that I have up here currently? Double bond is where they cannot rotate, right? Correct, yeah. And so because, so even this, is a, this doesn't look like a double bond, right? However, in this structure, nitrogen does have double bonds. Um, and then because this nitrogen is sp2120, uh, it's not able to rotate. So, we could say that even though in this version, remember the true resonance, the true structure is the hybrid between these two structures. This bond will also have partial double bond character. Did I hear a question? And so sorry, the two arrows that you draw and they're pointing at the alpha carbon of the two amino acids, all right? So they can rotate around the alpha carbon? Correct, yeah, the alpha carbon is the one you can rotate around. Yep. Good call. Good call. Yeah. Awesome. And then our last example is just going to be hydrolysis of peptide bonds. So peptide bonds are broken by hydrolysis. Hydrolysis, we know, is if we say hydrolysis, this would require acid or base in water. Hydrolysis is when you split water, but when you split water, 
you are also splitting something else. So we have HO and H. And when we split the carboxylic acid gets the OH back and the amino group gets the other H. And right now here. Hydrolysis. All right. Any questions on this example? I'm working, so I'll be right with you. All right. So that's it for what should just be a two-part lecture on biomolecules in organic chemistry. Any questions from those of you in class today for uh, recording while we're still recording for YouTube? All right, well, everybody watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed OCHEM, another OCHEM video. And next, next video is going to be on, um, we're gonna finish up with the degrees of protein structure as mentioned before, denaturation. Wow, <laughs> he's ready for me to be done too. Um, and then we're gonna move on to lipids and we'll do sugars and all the like, Hayworth projections, Fisher projections, common sugar, sugar isomers and all that good stuff. Uh, so thank you for watching. Uh, feel free to subscribe if you would like to follow me for more OCHEM content and feel free to leave any feedback or questions in the comment section. I will see you next time.